Okay, everyone, so for day one of our part three class, what we need to do is pick up where we last left off, uh, learning PouchDB, the JavaScript database. We need to finish that project, and then we need to incorporate it into our mobile app. So you should have a copy of all of the asset files. It's basically that index file, the, Javas, the jQuery JavaScript library, and the PouchDB JavaScript library. So we'll open up that index file in Notepad++. We're going to get back to our code that we were working with previously in Notepad++. We will go ahead and, just to remind ourselves what it was, I'm going to run it in Google Chrome. And I'll open my console. Remember F12 on the keyboard. Where did we last leave off? I'm going to put a little bit of content here. Save class. Okay. So where we last left off, we're setting up the foundation of our input fields and all of that. We're, we've set up the um, the ability to capture the text that's put into the input fields. We're starting to build a JSON formatted object, a document in PouchDB parlance. It is a, a bundle of data. It's a document in JSON format. And then we're saving it to the database. So I just put in some stuff. Don't worry about putting real content. Just putting ABC. I save that. And my console tells me, okay, you built that JSON object. And then I've put it into the database. PouchDB returned okay, true, the ID, and then a revision number. So last we left it, I was able to save something to the database. That's one of the four main operations, saving data, deleting data, retrieving data, modifying data. So in our code, Let's see. Add classes, clear fields. Okay, so we've got a couple of functions. The function to add the class, the function to clear the fields. Now we need to start talking about, okay, let's show this data on screen. Let's retrieve the data from the database and show it on screen. Um, what we're going to do is we've got a button on screen called show classes, which doesn't do anything yet. So we'll write an event handler for it. Once we click on it, do something, which is to retrieve the classes and show the classes. So we'll go over to, I've got line uh, 54, 55, give yourself a new line there, right after your clear fields function. syntax here to be able to click on that button to do something. We called the button btn show classes. So our jQuery selector is quotes pound btn show classes. That's the button that's waiting for us to click on it. It's the reference that we make, and once we click on it, we'll run a function like we've done previously. Uh, we've got quotes click function parentheses curly braces. Oops, out of the quotes. We're going to say that once a person clicks on that button, it will run the show classes function. Well, that means we need that means we need to define the show classes function. So on the next line, function show classes. Open and close curly braces.
PouchDB has many built-in operations. We have the dot put operation where we can save data to the database. We see that previously on the save classes function or add classes. We have other option, other operations like dot info, give me info about the database. We have a way to get data out of the database. It's simply dot get. Then we're able to get an item out of the database. We're able to get, however, one item at a time. In our case, I don't want that. I want to get all the data that's in my database. Pull it all out of my database so I can show it. I can, of course, get complex and show certain bits of data and certain records or documents. <coughs> I can get pretty fancy. But for the moment, I need to display a list of all my classes, all my documents in the database. So inside the show classes function, we'll write db. That's our database object. And to it, we'll have a method dot all docs capital D on that, all docs. This is the PouchDB method to get all the documents out of the database. This can have options and then a callback function because you want to do something with the results of trying to get the data out. Either we did get the data back, a success, or we didn't get a da the data out, a failure. So we have to deal with those two in a callback. We'll provide, a fun uh, we'll provide a couple of uh, options here first, and of course this all comes from the pouchdb.com um, website. We're going to provide it. What do the curly braces mean again by themselves? Jason, we're going to provide it a list of options. We're going to provide it a list of options. We're going to say, give me the data with these options. So in the curly braces, the PouchDB specification, we can specify more than one option at once. So what we'll say is, in quotes, include underscore docs space colon space true comma quotes ascending space colon space true. We're passing two options to all docs in JSON format. Key value, comma, key value. Last one, so no comma. One of them is include docs. By default, if we don't say include docs true, we're only really going to return, I believe, the ID of the data. But my data is made out of ID, instructor, class, um, title. We have three pieces of data. If we don't include all the bits of the document, we're only going to get back the ID. I want to then include all the data of each document. So that's true. And I want it returned to me, actually organized for me, in ascending order. From A to Z, alphabetically, including numbers and symbols. So here we're saying ascending true. If we didn't specify that, it would give it back to us basically in the order that we put it in, but I want it in alphabetical order. We can do other sorts of sorting, which is a little more complex, but here's what's built into PouchDB. Comma. And just like we had previously up here, for example, db.put, we had some sort of a, you know option, and then we had a, a, a function of callback. We'll do basically the exact same thing. So at the end of that line, we will do function, callback, open close, parentheses, open close, curly brace. We always get a result, or we usually get a result out of pouch, either an error result or a positive success result. So it'll kick back something, an object, either as error or result. We can call these whatever we want, but just to be consistent from our previous one, it can be the same thing, but in this order. Error, positive result. I'm going to break up the curly braces here into a couple of empty spaces. So just so that I don't lose track of this, I'll go to line 60 and I'll write and show classes. 
this curly brace ends my show classes function. This right here ends the all docs method and its callback function. Console log result Oops. result just to see what data it's giving back to us. Let's save it and run it. Put some data into your database. You know, two or three things. Click that show classes button. We're not done yet. But let's click that and let's see what our console tells us that we're pulling out of the database. So Check your spelling, save it and run it. Open your console and see what's see what's happening. Yes. Yes. Right there. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see what mine is doing. I'm gonna refresh that. I'm just gonna add some stuff. It doesn't have to be anything meaningful. That's something to think about for later on because right now we can really write anything we want to it, which might not be the best data. And what I'm doing is I've just filled it in with a little bit of stuff. I'm starting to have my console fill up with, with results. I like to, once in a while, clear out my console so I can focus on my latest feedback. And the way you do that in Chrome is you see this little you know, cancel button that's clear your console, or I guess control L. So you don't have to do this, but I, I clear my console once in a while just to focus on my latest feedback. I'm going to do show classes. That's at least telling me that my button, its event handler and such works, and it's saying, okay, the result, remember we did console log result. That result is an object. It says it's an object with total rows 3, offset 0, rows of an array of 3, which we can then open that up to get a bunch of other stuff. And then rows, and inside of rows, object 1, which is the first thing I typed. Well, actually, it's showing it to me in alphabetical order, like I asked, not the order that I typed it. The first thing that I typed was ABC. Then the next one I did this one here, and the third one I did numbers. So it's in alphabetical order. That's what that that's what that code for option that is that I gave it uh, right here in uh, ascending true. Whatever the way the data is, return it to me now. Alphabetized. Include all docs, all bits of the data of the doc. So we're getting some console output, hopefully, and all the all the real data is inside of the inside of the rows. So we're getting results, and then a property of rows, and inside of rows, the actual objects, the actual data. And one more item. Save that. Show classes. Now it says I've got four items, and you'll see inside of. Inside of the object, inside of rows, I've got objects 0, 2, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Did everyone get that? Okay, so we, we have a way then to pull the data out of the database. We next need to write some code to display that on screen and display it nice and pretty. Because as I said, JSON format is this sort of universal thing now that we get out of a lot of data sources. They're gonna, you're going to make a request such as dot all docs, and it'll give you back your data. But then it's still up to you to write some code to make it look nice. That's what we further have to do here. So we're going to take this data and we're going to display it as a simple table. Uh, a simple HTML table with rows and columns. If you've had any experience in HTML before, you might have had the impression that you don't want to use tables because tables was the old ways we did 
web design where we would divide up our screen and it was a it was a hack and we shouldn't use tables. No, we shouldn't use tables for design, but we still use tables for data. That's what tables are for, rows and columns of data. So we're going to pull together a, a table of this data that we're getting out of the database. That'll be a, a lot of operations, so we will run a function to build our table row by row. So here we'll invoke show table of classes function. We need to define this, of course, in a moment. We know we're getting the data. We see it in the console output. We then need to show it as a table. Well, in this case, we need to pass in a value. We need to pass in data into this function to actually you know, work with the data to display it. We're seeing that result is our object with all of our data. So we're going to pass it into our function. But we're going to be more specific. We're going to say result.rows. We're passing just the data in the rows property of the result object, which if you look at your console output, we're getting an object. That's result. In the object, we have rows. We have the property rows. And within rows, we have items 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, x. So I'm passing result.rows into my show table function. And result is coming from right here. We've got the error object, we've got the result object. This could be this could have been called data. Then of course this would be console data, data result. I mean data rows. You don't have to change it, but that's what's going on there. We've defined the object's name as result. And we're saying give me the prop uh, give me the rows of that object. Let's break outside of that function and we'll define another function. We need to define what does show table of classes actually do. Function show table of classes, open close parentheses, open close curly brace. Over here, we're passing data into that function. So as we define the function, we have to set it up that it takes a parameter. We'll just call that one result. That's the data we're passing into the function. inside of the function here. What we're going to do is let's check something here. What we're going to do is we're, we're going to um, similar to what we've done when we were when we were working on the JSON practice file where we were loading the um, social networks. We were building a string out of data, so we're going to do something very similar. So we'll create a variable. We'll call it str. That's our string. We'll say equals. We're going to build a, a table. A table is made out of the table tag. So, in quotes, we'll start writing our table tag. Next line, string, plus equals, end of the table. In between, think of these, uh, think of this as a sandwich we're about to build. These are the two buns, the table tags, the top and bottom, the buns. In the middle, we're going to fill it in with the lettuce and the tomatoes and the bacon, etc. And all of that is the data we're getting out of the database. The, fi the fillings of the sandwich are the data coming out of the database. The table is the buns holding it all together. So remember, plus equals is that we add to what's already in the string. 
So we started a table, we're going to add to it, we're going to close the table, plus equals. In between the two, well, let's back up a little bit. I know because what eventually what we're going to do as, a, as we build this table, a table is inherently invisible. It's rows and columns, but inherently it's invisible. We can, of course, style it via CSS, and we'll get to that. But for the moment, we'll add a couple of uh, attributes to our table so that at least we can see it. So back up to your table tag. And we'll add the attribute border dash uh, border equals single quotes one. This will give us a simple one pixel border around the boxes of our table. And we might as well add an ID here because we want to be able to affect it via CSS or other methods, JavaScript. We'll call it class table. So we're going to be able to see the table and then we're going to give it an ID. We'll go after before that. We'll go back to between the two strings and then we'll add something more to the string. We're going to start to build the first row of our table. And whenever you sign in on this pink sheet that passes around, do you see on the table here, you've got a row with headings, you know, students, please sign here, time in, time out, etc. This is our first row. It's a special row of headings that define what all the columns are. So we'll do the same thing here in HTML. We need to define a table row, tr, the tr tag creates a row of data, tr, this is a table row. My first row is going to define these columns. So inside of the table row, we'll write th tag, which has a pair. This is table heading, just like on the sign-in sheet. The very first cell of the first row says, student sign your name, th, table heading. Our data is made up of the CRN number the CRN of the class. So my first column will be titled CRN. Table heading of my table row, CRN. The ID number of the class, that CRN number. Another table heading. another table heading pair. And this time we're saying, in this next column, we're going to display the class, you know, the class title, the class name. One more table heading. And on the third column, we'll display the instructor, the name of the instructor. This is going to build our first row that's full of our headings, these columns, CRN class, and instructor. To see if this is working so far, I want to display this on screen. It won't display the data yet, but I want to see is it working so far. After we create the string, um, remember on screen we've got We've got a div on screen called div results. So what we will do is we will reference that div and we will write the data in our string to it. We've been doing document.getElementById several times, but because we've got jQuery, we can use the shorthand. So I'm going to do here the selector 
dollar parentheses quotes pound sign div results. That's the name of my div that's waiting on screen. That would be equivalent, of course, to document dot element, ele element by ID. And then we have a jQuery uh, method, which is HTML. And what that will do is it'll write any valid HTML into this div. Well, I want to put into it that string. That string that I'm building, render it as valid HTML, because it is full of valid HTML, table tag, tr tags, etc. Render that as HTML in that div. At the least here, we should see something. Go ahead and save it and run it. You should have data in your database. Click the Show Classes button. It won't show the classes yet, but it should at least show one row of a table with the headings that we've created there. CRN class and instructor. I have some data in my database, show classes, I have one row, I have one row of uh, CRN class and instructor. Did that work for everyone? I'm seeing that the space is a little tight. So I'm actually going to add, I'm going to back up to line 64. I'm going to start a p tag, and then 66. I'm going to end the p tag, just to give me a little inherent padding and such of a paragraph. I can, of course, edit that with via CSS. But, uh, this will work for the moment. So I'm adding a p tag at the beginning before the table starts, and then paragraph ending when the table ends. That result is simply a little bit of extra space. It's not so bumped up against the other elements. And yes, we're going to style that to look better later on. Here's the code so far. Okay, so similar to what we did with our JSON practice, we've got some data, and we need to do something with every piece of data. We're going to loop through it, just like before, where we will use a for loop for every element of my database, do something with it, for every element of my data displayed on screen. So in between the table tags, after the, the, the first row, Give yourself a new line, line 66. We will start our for loop. Our syntax looks like that. For all of our data, do some, uh, some parameters do something. Inside the for loop, we have to define the parameters of our loop, so we will start off the same as usual. var i equals zero, semicolon. We're starting with the zero with item of our data. We are going to then go i less than some maximum amount. Well, we have result dot length. Right, this result here. We've got a certain amount of rows that we're passing in a certain amount of data. It's in result. Result at length. We have at the moment five items or whatever. So loop until we get to four. Four is less than five. Five is not less than five. Semicolon. And then we increment our loop one at a time. Inside of the for loop, string plus equals. If you recall what we did in the JSON one, 
we saw how interesting that was to do, but very nuanced in our opening and closing parentheses and such, and quotes and everything. We have to do something similar. So it, it might look a little bit uh, messy on first glance, but we should see the logic of it. So we're going to first start in quotes to build one more table row. We're going to build another row. This new row is going to be a class, which will be its unique CRN instructor and class title. So a table row then, we have to define every particular cell, so it's going to be td slash td. THs are reserved for headings, the headings of a table, but then each individual cell of the, of the, of the table is a td, table data believe it stands for. So each then subsequent cell of my table here is a TD. And the first, in the first one where I'm going to display is result, um, square brackets, dot ID. And in the square brackets that's I. We're going to start with zero the zeroth item of our data. So in result.id, now that we've specified up here result, which is result.rows, now we can start to get the property of that result, which we've got id, we've got inst, let's see what else do we have, we've got, it's right here, we've got id, we've got title, we've got inst. Notice we don't use the underscore id, for some reason it's not consistent in that way, it's just the way that it is here. So right now we're saying here basically the zero with item show its ID. Now if you recall from Jason, this is in theory correct but in practice not because this will render as a string not as the actual value in the object. So here's where we have to get creative and break up our strings and do concatenation and all of that. So actually, we're going to back up, end that qu quote, space plus, plus space, start that quote. That will then display the actual ID, not literally print result ID save it and run it, we're not done yet, but save it and run it to see if it's starting to try to build your first column full of IDs. Exactly. Um, it should work. I'll check both ways, but it should not work with the underscore. It sh let's check it right now. Yeah, it just seems to not be consistent in that one example. See, there it is. If I show classes, it's building my first column of data. If I do underscore ID just to confirm, it should not work. Yep, undefined. So underscore ID would make sense because that's what my JSON object is made of. But it seems that we don't use it here, simply under simply ID. Pause here. If it's working, I've got some data, show classes. It's building my first row, and now it's starting to build my first column. I've defined what will I show on my first table data. So it's all of those. At the moment it's gibberish, but if I was doing, you know, class one, two, three with Android One and Instructor Campos, save class, show class, there's one, two, three. It doesn't show the rest, I haven't set that up yet. Let's say then I do class nine 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 which is Android 2, Instructor uh, Smith, save that class, show that class, 1, 2, 3, 9, 9, 9. Again, this is not really going to be testing for anything meaningful because I could do class XYZ in English, Instructor Jones, save class, show class, XYZ, the last item. 
It's giving it to me in alphabetical order, taking into account numbers and symbols. We haven't dealt with that. I can just put in just, you know, crazy symbols. Oh, there's Yosemite Sam yelling at me. And then uh, Cartoons 101 and Instructor Leghorn. Save that, show that, and say, yep, here it is, alphabetical order. Symbols are going to be first. And so it's that. I haven't built the other parts of the table yet. But it should start to show your data, at least the first column. Here's the code so far. We still need to build two more cells. It's going to get messy if we leave it all on one long line. So I'm going to break this right here. The end of the row, the end of the table data, the end of the cell, and the end of the row, I move that down to its own one. It looks a little weird all by itself, but that's because we've got that string and the concatenation and it continues here, and then we'll ignore the white space. So, open close quotes, close TD, open TD. That looks a little weird, but look at the logic of it. I'm closing the previous TD, which is this cell of the ID. Then I'm opening another cell, TD, and closing it there, to then display result i dot, it's my other field called, title, the class name. So plus result dot title plus, because we have to continue the string right there, so we get i. We start with zero, the zero with item, the zero with item, the zero with title. So this cell starts, show the title, the cell ends, close the row, close the table. Display the whole thing on speed. Again, I'm not making these up. Actually, we did when we defined our JSON object. I'm just going back to what did we call our bundle of classes? ID title inst. Result show classes. Oops, did I spell that properly? Oh, yeah. Why am I putting zero? That's an I. Uh, I, which is set to zero, I item, I index. Okay, so that should then say, refresh that. One more thing. When we look at the object result, we've got dot rows. Then we look at the object inside of that row, we've got ID. That's why we can simply write result dot ID. Inside of the object, we've got ID. And then inside of the object, we've got doc. Inside of doc is where there's underscore ID and then inst and then title. So this should actually be doc.title. So we've got the larger object, then we've got doc, then we've got title. We were able to do just dot ID because it is on that level. If we did, I suppose, doc dot underscore ID, that's when we would do the underscore ID. 
we can save ourselves a little bit of effort because it's on the top level of the object, so to speak. There it is. CRN column, class column, and then very some, something very similar for instructor. And again, to show you why that worked, we've got the object, then we've got rows, then we've got docs, and inside of docs is where we've got title. We're going to do something then for the next column. Make sure you've got that plus at the end there. Next line, exact same thing as before. We need to close that table data, open a new one, which will be closed on the next line. Result i doc inst plus. We called our JSON object field inst, if we called it instructor or teacher or whatever, we would then refer to it here. That all goes back to how we de defined our schema back on the dot put operation. Classes, there's my complete table. Now, if everything alphabetized by a CRN, then whatever class name it is, and then the instructor. We would, of course, have to program it to organize it in any other way. We would have to program it to be able to organize dynamically, but at the very least, it's showing everything in alphabetical order based on. CRN of the class. Putting in a little gibberish then makes me want to delete it. And that's the next thing we'll do in a moment. Let's pause here, make sure everyone's on track. You should be you should have a table built based on all of our data. We'll of course deal with it looking nicer and such. Later we'll talk about zebra striping. Have you heard of that term? Zebra striping? That's when you've got a row of a certain color, another row of a different color, and a row of the same color. Alternating colors which makes a table a lot easier to read. Right now it's just a big wall of text. Via CSS, a little bit later, we will alternate colors back and forth for better readability. Where's my code so far? Anyone need a little help? Yeah.
Let me show you why you can run it and make you prone to show you. We'll do one more thing, then we'll take a break. This is, uh, hopefully, we've got some data being retrieved and then displayed. So we've got two things going on here in our code. One is retrieve the data, show classes. One is actually build the table right there. We're not, we're not done with this just yet. Um, we uh, want to display it nicer and all of that good stuff. But what I want to do is set up a way to delete classes. We have many ways to do this, of course, but here's my idea. I'm going to say that I'm going to have a functionality, a new set of input fields here. An input field where I can select which class and then click delete. Yes, of course, we can program it so that we have a button right here to delete. We'll do something like that a little later, but I want to show you some of these possibilities. So we're going to dynamically create another input field. Another input field for them to select the class to delete and then delete. So via JavaScript, we can create these input fields dynamically. These will not exist until we have something to delete. So we're going to back up to our show table of classes before we actually display the string. Let's give ourselves a new line. We will add a little bit more to the string. So this is happening after the end of the table. We will display a simple horizontal rule simple divider. Of course, we can get more complex and fancy with jQuery Mobile. But for the moment here, just a little divider. Next line, another string. And then here, we're going to create an input, an input field, type, these are single quotes, text, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take text, placeholder to guide people. What should they be putting in there? Class, you know, 1, 2, 3, X. An ID so that we can reference it via the JavaScript. This will be um, delete. CRN. So here, this will create an input field after there's data to display. So this is not new, we're just displaying it dynamically. Furthermore, then, we need a button so that we can capture that data and do something with it. So, still inside the quotes, we're still building this string. We can't exactly divide it into the next line unless we do the plus and all of that. I'll keep it on one. Button, close button. This button will be named delete class. And the button needs an ID. BTN delete. So building our input field with its various attributes, then we're building our button, end of line. All of this is being created after we've shown our table. Go ahead, save it, and run it. So 
But if I do sh show classes, it's building up this new area here. There's the horizontal rule. There's going to be a spot for the person to type in the CRN number. So if it's class 999, I would click delete class. As I said, we could set this up so that there's some button right next to it here to click to delete. We're going to do something like that where we're going to edit the class. Here I'm making it a little bit on purpose couple of steps to jump through. The person has to type the class that they're trying to delete, class 1, 2, 3, and then delete. In a sense, that's a little safer. If it's simply press delete to delete, that's very unsafe. We would then have to set up, okay, click the delete button, a pop-up to confirm it, and then delete it. So any way we want to do this, we're going to have a few steps. This is our way here. Some, <coughs> some input field, and then delete. Obviously it doesn't work yet, but that's what our line 74 is doing. We're, we're, we're building a brand new input field. So then we need to write some event handler to make that button active, to then take that data and then delete the item from the database. So after, after our function, this is completely outside of our show table of classes which I'll make my comment here and show table of classes. After that, we need to do the thing that we usually do, which is some sort of event handler like that. Quotes. BTN, what do we call this? BTN delete. Click. Function. Let's say this will be our delete class function. I'm kind of doing it a bit quickly, but it should make sense because we've done this several times before. There's our event handler. It's our jQuery selector to select the button that's on screen there on click run a function do the rest so we've done we've done that several times this will be a variety of actions we need to do here so just to make sure this is working we'll do a console log just whatever output we want about to delete this will at the very least show us that we're on track. And if we click that button, our console should say about to delete. It won't delete yet. We still have several lines of that. Save and run that. Show classes shows that up. This still doesn't work, but as, at least if I click delete, the theory is that it'll run the, the function delete class and it'll say about to delete. Nothing's happening. Not even any console output, not even any error. This is one of these logic errors that's very difficult to troubleshoot for, unless you're a pro and have everything about JavaScript memorized. This is actually a very difficult problem in theory to fix if you don't have every grasp of, of JavaScript. Because think about what's happening. As soon as I load up my project, this is all of the code that currently exists. All of the code that has been rendered and put on screen. And I've got an event handler to handle a button to click on, which at the moment doesn't exist. It's here. It literally doesn't exist. Well, then when I click Show Classes, the button gets created. But all the code has already run. And therefore, this, this event handler here doesn't know what to do. Delete button class didn't exist at the moment of runtime, so this 
doesn't work at all. It doesn't know what we're talking about. So the logic of it, our syntax is right here. It's worked right before, but the logic of it is we've created a dynamic button that now we need to reference in a different kind of way. So actually, our code should be like this. The selector is going to first be to body. We're going to say anywhere on the body, anywhere in the document that we click on, specifically, now here's something new, specifically quotes pound btn delete comma. Anywhere that we click on the body, specifically on the delete button, run the function. We've added a new parameter to on that we didn't need before, because now we've got a dynamic button that doesn't exist until after we show classes. This way should work. Now it's look at the body element, then look for the btn delete element and run my function. Previously, when we had it up here, it's simply look for the btn delete element and use it. Now, show classes, delete class, about to delete, about to delete. We have several lines to work with here, so actually, let, I'm going to save my work, we'll take our first break. And I'll put my code up to this point in the folder. At this point, it should work as mine is, and this is something new here that we're going to need to deal with a little bit more a little bit later. But a new parameter, a new bit of specificity to what we're clicking on, especially if it's dynamically created. It's 7.28. We'll take a break until 7.38.